Welcome everyone. Sorry for the slight delay in, in getting started here. Welcome to the webinar, Safety Alarms, the intersection of alarm management and functional safety. My name is Stoff, Director of Alarm Management here at Exeter. Similar to other webinars, uh, the audio, you will be muted for the audio. And uh, the best way to communicate with us if you have questions related to the content is to enter that into the questions box. We'll try and address them at the end of the presentation, depending upon the amount of time that we have left, or most likely we will answer them after the fact via email and we'll distribute that to everyone. So let's get started then. As I mentioned, my name is Todd Stauffer. I work in alarm management here at Exeter, and I work directly with some of the key standards that we're gonna talk about um, that provide guidance on safety alarms, in particular, the ISA 18.2 standard, which I've been involved with since 2005. And then a new one that's being worked on by ISA um, that is called Safety Controls Alarms and Interlocks, so it directly relates to the requirements of safety alarms and the things that we're talking about today. So if you're not familiar with Exida, uh, we were founded in 1999 to make the world, and in particular process plants, a safer place. We're a global supplier for products and services related to functional safety, cybersecurity and alarm management. We're very well known in certification of devices and people with um, outstanding programs there. And we have a suite of software for safety instrumented system design and engineering of which we consider alarm management to be a part of that. So we have a tool called SIL Alarm for alarm rationalization. And on the alarm management side, we are also partners with a couple of uh, process control system suppliers, namely Rockwell and Emerson. So. Again, what we're talking about in this webinar <clears throat> is safety alarms, which is the intersection of the world of alarm management and the world of functional safety. And when I say world, I really do mean world. They are two very different worlds. Um, the folks that work in each area have different care, care abouts, different things that they work with. And it is truly a challenge to create a comprehensive set of requirements that brings into account the thoughts and needs from the alarm management world, as well as from the functional safety world. So in terms of what we're gonna talk about in this webinar, we will discuss what a safety alarm is, what it's not, and why you should care. We will talk about several uh, guidelines and standards that exist today from ISA, from IEC, um, MUA, some documents from the HSE in the UK, um, so good sources of information and requirements related to safety alarms. And in particular, what we're looking at is some of the similarities and differences between them and kind of create a collection of requirements and ways to treat safety alarms by looking at all of them together. So we'll talk about how to identify a safety alarm and then some of the requirements, the examples from these different standards about how to treat certain examples of safety alarms. And then we will kind of tie it all together with a more, with a pragmatic approach um, along the lines of what the new ISA standard is, is promoting. And we'll talk about what's happening in terms of new standards and guidelines around safety alarms. You'll see that there are actually multiple organizations that are working on creating new guidelines because they see a, a need and a gap in this area. So let's start with a, a poll question for you to think about in terms of what you consider examples of safety alarms to be. Are they alarms that are associated with a safety instrumented system? Either the pre-trip alarm or the activation alarm or perhaps diagnostic alarms associated with the health of the SIS? 
Are they alarms for mitigation or personnel safety, life safety? Are they specific to the application, like for example, tank overflow high level alarms? And do they um, identify themselves based on the analysis that is done and their level of risk reduction and where they are called out, whether it's a LOPA or a process hazard analysis? So right now there is no answer to this question or the, question, or the answer is actually, it depends. Probably every single one on this list could be considered a safety alarm depending upon the situation. And we will talk more about that as we go on. So what is the purpose of an alarm and what are we looking at in this webinar? So in a typical scenario, the basic process control system is able to keep the process within your normal operating range, the green zone. Um, on an upset, if it's not able to maintain the control, that's when we want an alarm to occur to indicate that there's an abnormal situation that requires the operator's attention and action. If the operator takes that action in a timely fashion, then the process turns around and goes back into the normal operating range. If they don't take the action in time, then the process escalates further leading to either a shutdown or some type of consequence. So if you look at this, you can see there's really two purposes for alarms. One could be to try to keep the process in the green area, our normal operating range or normal operating limits. So those are, we'll call them operational limits. And then another purpose for an alarm would be to help you keep the process out of the red zone, which is where the SIS would activate or you would have a consequence. So we'll call those our plant safety alarms or the alarms for safety. Now this webinar is gonna focus pretty much solely on the second type of alarm, alarms that are there for the purpose of safety. So why are we so worried about safety alarms? Why is that so special and why would we have a, a dedicated webinar on it? Well, safety alarms are one of the first layers of protection to prevent a hazard to escalate into an incident. So if we look at these layers of protection associated with this tank, we can see that the alarm and operator intervention is one of the first layers. So the best way to make your SIS effective or the, the way to help it be as effective as possible, as well as your other risk reduction methodologies, is to ensure that that first layer of protection, the alarms, is as effective as possible. And that's essentially what we are going to talk about, how to do that. Now, there are many different standards, guidelines, and documents that exist that provide um, some level of requirements or guidance on safety alarms. Um, combining again the world of alarm management, and I'm going to reference all of these standards and documents that you see here as a way to kind of disseminate some of this information. Uh, so we've got the ISA 18.2 standard, or it's international sister standard, IEC 62682. We'll be referencing that. We'll also be looking at ISA 84, I, which is uh, sister standard, IEC 61511. And then you also see other um, subsequent standards in the functional safety world uh, that are put out by ISA, some technical reports, some standards. And then in the alarm management world, there's the AMUA 191 guideline, and then also a document from the HSE in the UK called OG47. We'll be referencing all of those. Now for folks that run plants in the US and are subject to OSHA PSM guidelines and regulations, they must comply with ISA 18.2 and ISA 84 uh, because those are considered RAGAGAP or recommended and generally accepted good engineering practice. So when it comes to safety alarms, we need to look at the relevant requirements from both of those areas. Here's a more complete list even of different documents and sources of information and guidance on safety alarms. 
even beyond what we had seen on, on the last slide, including some that are sector specific, such as API recommended practice 1167. So you can see there really are a lot of different sources of guidance on safety alarms, which is good and bad at the same time. So now let's talk about what a safety alarm is and what it is not. So a safety alarm is not necessarily the alarm that precedes a safety interlock trip. It's also not necessarily the indication of the trip or any alarm that has a safety consequence or any alarm that's designated as a safeguard or any alarm that's part of an independent protection layer or any alarm that's part of an SIS or is an SIS diagnostic alarm. So this could be kind of confusing, but the idea is it's more than just what these different um, scenarios indicate. There's a, a process for determining whether something is a safety alarm. So just because it meets one of these statements does not necessarily mean that it must be or is a safety alarm. So let's look at um, how safety alarms are actually defined in those documents and standards that we saw. The first one is the AMUA 191 document, which came out originally in 1999. So this has been around for a while. And it focuses on safety alarms where they meet, or they have a risk reduction of greater than a factor of 10. So that means they are essentially SIL rated alarms, and they are rated as SIL 1, which means then that they must comply with the requirements of being a safety instrumented system. Similarly, the guidance from the HSE also talks about safety alarms in the light of them having a risk reduction factor of greater than 10. So this is very specific and also very hard to meet in general. Some other guidelines kind of relax some of those constraints a little bit. Some of the CCPS guidelines talk about um, alarms that the operator responds to to provide a level of required risk reduction for an identified hazard, et cetera. You can read what's there. Um, so that's a little bit more ambiguous and open, possibly including more alarms. But one of the key things that I wanted to call out is it does still mention required risk reduction. So, so far what we're looking at with safety alarms is some notion that there's been some risk reduction calculations or analysis. Similarly with the ISA 849101 standard, um, this talks about process safety safeguards in general. It includes similar language to the one that we just talked about and adds achieving or maintaining a safe state for a process. Well, that verbiage seems to indicate that we're working with preventative measures only and not mitigative safeguards. So you can see that we've kind of, each of these definitions um, stakes out a certain territory in, in the world of alarms and events and the requirements associated with them. So what we're gonna propose going forward then is that for safety alarms, you, you use this definition or concept instead. And that is, and this comes from the ISA 18.2 standard and also the international version. And it says that a safety alarm is an alarm that is classified as critical to process safety for the protection of human life or the environment. So it would potentially include those other four definitions that we saw there, but you can see that it is kind of going to put the onus on the end user to determine which alarms should be considered safety alarms through a process called classification, which we will talk more about. Some other definitions that we need to talk about, safeguards, what is a safeguard? It's any device system or action that would likely interrupt the chain of events following an initiating event or mitigate the consequences. So safeguards in general can be preventive or mitigative. 
So the definition of a safety alarm that we want to use includes both preventive and mitigative safeguards. During a PHA, safeguards are identified that could potentially interrupt that chain of events. To determine how well they work or how valid they are, that's when the layer protection analysis comes in. So that will determine how effective those safeguards are and whether they truly can be counted on to prevent um, the escalation. So slightly different from a safeguard and independent protection layer is a similar device system or action that is capable of preventing the scenario from escalating. So there's some level of uh, expected performance or reliability um, with the IPL and calculation of its performance in that it will interrupt the chain of events. It needs to be independent, which means it can't be impacted by the initiating event occurring or failure of other protection layers. It needs to be auditable to show that its performance can be achieved. And in particular for alarms, we would be concerned and need to make sure that there's sufficient time for the operator to perform their corrective action. And that total time would include the components of detecting the alarm condition, diagnosing what the problem is, determining the appropriate corrective action, and then taking that corrective action. And then one of the takeaways here also is that IPLs are a subset of safeguards. So every IPL or independent protection layer is a safeguard, but not every safeguard meets the additional requirements for being an IPL. So now let's look at the first standard or first document that talks about safety alarms and requirements, and that's the EMUA 191 document. I said it first came out in 1999. This is information from the third edition, 2013. And it's pretty clear that safety alarms in this document are those alarms that have a risk reduction of greater than 10, essentially SIL-1, uh, and must meet those requirements. So if it is a SIL-1 function, then by definition, it needs to follow and comply with the requirements of IEC 61511. So it needs to be treated as a safety instrumented system. And of course, that would mean it needs to be independent from the basic process control system. So that's pretty strict. It does also include other good recommendations and guidelines, which we'll go through quickly here. First, that the operator should be trained on the individual alarm, what it means, the cause, the consequence, the corrective action. Should make sure that the HMI presentation allows the safety alarms to stand out and be easily distinguishable from other alarms. Those, the safety alarms should be assigned the highest priority in the system. They should always be viewable by the operator, should not be obscured by new alarms coming in or other graphical elements. In terms of the operator knowing what to do, the guidance should be a clear written alarm response procedure for the alarm, so defined beforehand. And that response procedure should be simple, obvious, and invariant. And that's a good point to think about. What that means is the instructions on how to respond should be relatively simple and straightforward. Safety alarms are, are most likely going to occur during significant plant upsets and significant stressful times for the operator. So what this is saying is we can't expect the operator to do any elaborate or advanced troubleshooting uh, for a safety alarm because that introduces a significant opportunity for a mistake. And what we're looking for is High, high reliability in the response. So we want scenarios where the action is quite obvious or quite easy to get across to the operator and there's not many permutations. We also wanna make sure that the HMI is designed for situational awareness so that it provides 
relevant information or uh, corroborative information related to the alarm to show other process measurements so that the operator can easily tell what's what's going on and knows what to do. And last but not least, uh, the, the eighth uh, recommendation is that the claim performance should be audited. Now, these requirements are actually referenced in the next document, OG47, which is a document from the Health and Safety Executive in the UK that basically defines the requirements, auditable requirements, for what needs to be followed for safety alarms. And in this case, they coin a new term called a safety instrumented alarm function. And again, it can be preventive or mitigative in this um, scenario. And it is also um, specifically just for alarms that have a risk reduction factor of greater than 10. One of the, the key points of this document that it introduces is also to make sure that when we're thinking about the operator response to an alarm, to a safety alarm, that we're not only considering the operator's response, but the other pieces of the total function, which include the sensor, the enunciator, the interconnecting equipment, and the final element. So we need to make sure that we're still thinking about all those pieces of hardware in the system in addition to the operator. And it assumes that we're operating in demand mode. This is an example of some of the information in that guideline. It's got a flow chart for how to process and manage those safety alarms, pretty much based on what the level of risk reduction is for the alarm. So it first starts with whether there's a risk reduction of greater than 100 or SIL2, basically saying that that is not recommended. And if you were to have a scenario like that, that you should really redesign to, uh, to implement automatic measures. There's another decision box that looks at whether it's a um, risk reduction of 10 or greater. And it calls out the consideration of whenever you have a safety alarm, whether it would not be better to try to redesign and replace with an automatic function, which is something to, to think about as the automatic function may likely be more reliable than an, than an operator response. The flowchart also defines the callouts for the requirements and the guidelines that need to be followed, depending upon whether the alarm is, is a SIL1 alarm or whether it's an alarm with risk reduction less than 10. It also provides additional guidance in the form of matching up with the functional safety life cycle. So what does that mean? Well, this guideline is for alarms that are basically SIL1, so they need to comply with a safety instrumented system and the functional safety life cycle. There are different stages in that functional life safety life cycle, and what this document does is define some of the alarm specific considerations that align with the different stages in the life cycle. And here's an example of just one for clause 10, which has to do with the safety requirements spec. So in addition to what's in there for a traditional SIS function uh, for an alarm, it says you would also wanna identify the sensor, the enunciator, and the final element. You wanna make sure you're looking at common cause failures. And then when it comes to the operator response, you wanna make sure that that is documented in the SRS and meets the two, um, two of the eight requirements or recommendations that we saw on EMEA 191. Basically that the alarm response is defined and that it's simple, concise, and invariant. So again, examples of alarm specific requirements, that can be kind of added into or merged into uh, safety instrumented system requirements. So now let's move on to uh, another standard from the US, that is ISA 84.9101, which relates to the mechanical integrity of a grouping of functions called safety controls, alarms, and interlocks. So the definition here is about process safety safeguards implemented within 
instrumentation and control, so not mechanical um, safeguards, but truly instru instrumented functions used to maintain a safe state. So here it's looking like it's primarily focused on preventive safeguards and requiring a level of risk reduction. So some risk reduction discussion or calculations are done. Now what this standard primarily addresses is mechanical integrity. So when it comes to safety alarms, the guidance and requirements that this document contributes relate to periodic testing and maintenance as part of an overall mechanical integrity program. Now let's look at the IEC 61511 standard, the functional safety standard for SIS. And that contains a significant amount of information. In this case, I'm not going to show all of it. I'm just gonna pick out selected examples. And in this case, we're gonna look at some of the examples from the list that we looked at at the beginning of what things could be considered a safety alarm. So in this case, we're looking at the example of, a, of an alarm that indicates that there was a fault detected in your SIS. So 61511 provides guidance that says, if the compensating measures that are being used associated with the de detection of this fault involve the operator taking specific action in response to an alarm, then that alarm needs to be considered part of the SIS. So that means it's probably gonna to have to follow the requirements of a safety alarm. So here's an example of one type of a safety alarm application, potential safety alarm application. And that you can see that it's also subject to requirements such as testing and relevant management of change. Another example comes from looking at the safety requirements spec, which may have requirements for specific diagnostic alarms to be set up that would be triggered or tested um, during proof tests. And that SRS should also document requirements for bypass alarms. So when or if that safety instrument and function needs to be bypassed, what is the maximum permitted repair time and what alarms ideally should be associated or presented to the operator under that circumstance. Some of the details to think about or consider is the different figures of merit when it comes to repair time, whether we're looking at mean repair time or mean time to restoration or the maximum permitted repair time, that information should be defined in the SRS and that should be used then to design the bypass alarms. So, and as part of that, the alarm philosophy document should document and, and define what is the purpose of the bypass alarm. So some um, customers or some end users use bypass alarms to indicate that there is a bypass that is active. So as soon as it is active, that alarm goes off and basically stays there until the bypass is released. Others choose to implement the bypass alarm to indicate that perhaps the bypass has been left on or is left active for too long. So that would mean perhaps setting a bypass alarm to go off after the maximum permitted repair time is up or in relation to that, to make sure that that repair and the reason for the bypass is being done in the appropriate time. So depends on uh, what you wanna use bypass alarms for, need to be defined in the alarm philosophy and then the SRS. Now moving on to another guideline or document, this is ISA TR84 part one, which provides guidelines for implementation of the IEC 61511 standard. It contains multiple sections or annexes that provide um, relevant information on specific topics. Annex B actually focuses on safety alarms. There are other annexes which um, provide useful information as well, compensating measures, how to establish alarm 
how to establish set points and things like that. So let's take a look at some of the information that comes from this guideline. So one of the key things that it discusses is the amount of time that the operator has to respond, realizing that that's a key important thing in determining or making sure that the safety alarm is going to be useful and effective. It provides recommendations or guidelines on how much time should be available for the operator to respond. And in this table, what's interesting is we see that, that the safeguard can be implemented in the basic process control system or the SIS. So you can see this document already has a, a wider berth or a wider range of potential alarms being considered safety alarms and that it doesn't exclude the implementation within the basic process control system. And then there's some other interesting requirements that go along with the implementation. So if we're using a safety alarm and implementing it in the BPCS, we still want to make sure that the hardware is as reliable as possible. It may not necessarily need to meet the integrity requirements of an SIS, but we still need to be mindful of it. And you can see the requirement here that it should be implemented and managed per 8491. What's also interesting is when we look at the time spans and the different types of considerations, if the operator has a short period to respond, short period of time, 10 minutes, then that means that you can't expect them or it can't involve significant or any troubleshooting or diagnostics. So it must be very straightforward what has happened and what they need to do. It's only if you have more time, like on the order of 40 minutes, can you assume that the operator could successfully do some level of minor troubleshooting. But notice it's minor troubleshooting, not significant diagnostic diagnosis. So it can't be a if-then chart where there are 10 different possible sources of the alarm that each of which needs to be checked out to determine what the potential cause is. Because again, this is going to be a high stress scenario where the operator needs to look at a lot of things and respond quickly. So the guidance and what they need to do and check on needs to be relatively straightforward, cannot be very complicated. This document also provides some examples of what it would consider safety alarms that could be implemented in the basic process control system. So here we've got alarms that have a risk reduction of less than 10, alarms that are used for SIS bypass where the required risk re reduction of the SIS is only partially lost, not completely, shelter alarms and uh, emergency shower and eye, eye bath actuation or eye wash actuation alarms. Those are also mentioned as examples. For safety alarms that are implemented in a SIS, here we're talking about alarms with a risk reduction greater than 10, of course, life safety alarms or evacuation alarms, diagnostic alarms that relate to some of the support systems for the SIS, so electrical, um, air, pneumatic, air, etc. cetera, um, faults related to the SIS or scenarios, failures related to the SIS not um, activating on demand or not uh, performing its role. And again, bypass alarms that in this case indicate that the SIS is not capable of providing its level of risk reduction. So examples for safety alarm implementation in SIS, and then some of the design considerations and guidelines for those two sets of um, scenarios. First, in the BPCS, making sure there's sufficient time for the operator to respond, that the actions are covered and documented by a procedure of which the operators are tested and trained on, and that all of the um, devices involved in the loop are subject to proof testing, access control, and management change. One of the key takeaways here is there no human factor analysis or human error analysis is, is required, and there is no requirement for PFD calculations.
that changes when we look at safety alarms that are implemented in an SIS. So here we want to make sure that all of the hardware meets the requirements of IEC 61511, that there's sufficient time for the operator to respond. And then the last three bullet items down here are significant in that they call for uh, human error analysis to be done to make sure that the operator truly can respond and provide the level of reliability that's required, including performing or including the operator reliability in your SIL verification calculations. Now that can be kind of tricky because there really is no accepted methodology or PFD uh, evaluation process for operator reliability. So that makes that a challenging process. Other information guidelines that are in this document include how to set alarm limits for safety alarms and what you should be considering, including measurement uncertainty, process dead time, operator response, et cetera, and also shows how that might relate to your equipment design constraints or your safety instrumented functions. Now we'll move on to the ISA 18.2 standard. So the last standard that we'll, we'll really consider here. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is the classification process. When I mentioned what a safety alarm was initially and the definition that I said we would carry forward, it involved or called out this classification process. So what is classification and what is it for? It's a way of separating alarms into groups that have common sets of requirements. So requirements for how frequently they are tested or how frequently operators are trained on the response. Uh, might have different management of change requirements or reporting requirements. And an example is the alarm that we see here in this picture that essentially means um, that one should not go into the analyzer shed because there's a low oxygen environment. Um, so that's a pretty important alarm, relates to life safety, would probably be tested monthly or more frequently, and certainly operators would be rel well trained to understand to not go in there or to um, address in a special way if the beacon was going off. So certainly those kind of alarms would have a different level of requirements than your average process alarm. And that's the purpose of classification. Here are some examples of classification. They could be there for equipment reliability or the classifications could be used to um, indicate alarms that are for equipment reliability, product quality, environmental protection, and for safety. This is an important usage of classification to indicate which alarms are there for safety purposes. And there could be different levels of safety or different um, granularity of, of uh, safety types of classifications. And you would not necessarily need all of these, but you could have a uh, classification for safeguard alarms. You could have one for alarms that are listed in layer protection analysis. And then last and most important, safety alarms or safety related alarms if you're in the UK or Europe. So safety alarms are a classification um, and that's what the classification um, process is for is to help you figure out which alarms are safety alarms. There are other uh, folks in industry that believe classification, examples of classification would be, for example, alarms that require periodic training or periodic testing. You can see that if you follow that approach, then you're not going to be able to effectively identify safety alarms. And that's going to be a big problem um, in, in what we see going forward here. Now, safety alarms are considered highly managed alarms. What, is, what does that mean? That's another um, statement that comes out of the alarm management standards. So highly managed alarms are alarms belonging to a class. So quality critical, environmental, personnel safety, safety alarms that have additional requirements above and beyond general alarms. And the example in this definition is safety alarms. 
So one can make the connection that safety alarms are also highly managed alarms. And when you do that, what does that mean? That means there are specific requirements that shall be followed then, which are defined in the alarm management standards. I forget exactly how many requirements there are. There are some of my colleagues that know that by heart. I think it's 32 or 36, something like that. But it comes out in areas like the use of shelving or initial testing, operator training, periodic testing. So there are different areas where there are specific requirements for highly managed alarms. So again, the connection here, or if you follow the, the path, is safety alarms are alarms that are classified as critical to process safety for the protection of human life or the environment. Highly managed alarms, safety alarms are an example of a highly managed alarm. And if you have safety alarms, then you can assume that they should also follow the requirements that are defined in the alarm management standards for highly managed alarms. And specific examples include for shelving to make sure that authorization and reauthorization requirements are documented, that there's an audit trail of approvals and reapprovals and reauthorization for safety alarms that are to be shelved. Uh, and you can also see others here related to training, refresher training, and testing. So these are all explicitly defined in the alarm management standards. And incidentally, they are consistent with OSHA PSM guidelines. So if you're looking at this from a OSHA PSM perspective, part of the reason why the highly managed alarm concept was created was to um, define the requirements that you would follow or need to follow if you were trying to comply with OSHA PSM. So there's also requirements then around initial testing. So you can see by looking at this that this is a pretty rigorous set of requirements that one might not want to or might not be able to follow for all alarms which is why we have to be judicious about what alarms we say are safety alarms, because one can draw the connection that they must follow these requirements amongst other things. So we've looked at five or six different documents and guidelines and standards that call out information and recommendations and in some case requirements for the treatment of safety alarms. Some disagree or um, are not in alignment or consistent with each other. So what should one do at this point? So let's look at taking a pragmatic approach to safety alarms, one that is, I would say, consistent with where industry is going now. So we first must recognize that there are different ways that a safety alarm can be identified. It doesn't always come through a process hazard analysis or a LOPA, which is what many of the earlier definitions that we looked at kind of implied. It could be prescribed as good engineering practice for your particular application. It could be prescribed by certain regulations, or it could be company practice to implement certain types of safety alarms, such as um, life safety or fire and gas detectors. So the need for those safety alarms won't have anything to do with a hazard and risk assessment or a PHA. So none of that information will necessarily be around and there may not be any risk reduction calculations involved with that. But that doesn't mean that it's not a safety alarm because it's um, critically important to help maintain the safety of people of your process or your process. In addition, it could be based on uh, incident investigation or it could come out of the safety requirements spec. So acknowledging that there's different sources of where the safety alarm can come from also says that safety alarms can be preventive or mitigative in terms of um, being safeguards. They can be implemented in the BPCS or the SIS, or a third scenario is a dedicated safety alarm system. In terms of risk reduction, certainly if uh, it's greater than 10, as many of the earlier definitions implied, 
that would be a safety alarm. It could be a safety alarm. But we also have to allow for the possibility that it may be less than or equal to 10, which means it could be in the BPCS, or that uh, there is no risk reduction whatsoever claimed, um, such as those alarms that are prescribed by uh, the company or by regulations. So in terms of a working definition of a safety alarm, in addition to what ISA 18.2 has, what we're looking at in the 84.9103 standard, where we're trying to kind of pull this all together, a working definition of a safety alarm at this point would be something like safety alarm is a process safety safeguard implemented within instrumentation and controls that is identified by the authority having jurisdiction. And that is either the owner operator and or the local regulatory authority. So that puts the onus on you to determine what is a safety alarm and makes it more based on your application rather than being prescriptive. So if we take the requirements and the concepts that have been discussed in the previous guidelines and pull them together in a pragmatic way, we can look at requirements for safety alarms implemented in different ways. So right now, the, the main three categories that we're looking at in the 84.9103 standard include essentially three different permutations. There is the SIL rated alarm, the one that's defined in AMUA 191, where your risk reduction is greater than 10. You're implemented in the, the SIS, and you're independent from the basic process control system. Those, I would say, are definitely should be following highly managed alarm requirements for those kind of classifications. The second implementation approach is it's an in independent protection layer alarm that may have a risk reduction of 10 or less, which means it can it can be implemented in the basic process control system, but just because it's in the basic process control system doesn't mean that we're not concerned about it working reliably. So there's probably some uh, level of hardware integrity that should be specified, maybe not to the level of, of SIL ratings, but certainly we want reliable um, sensors and final elements uh, for IPL alarms. The third category would be safeguards, those that uh, don't have any risk reduction assigned to them. They may follow a similar design as the IPL alarms, but not have any requirements for hardware reliability and maybe um, less strict requirements for testing and training. So this is an example. These are not necessarily the requirements that must be followed. And it does not mean that every SIL rated alarm is a safety alarm or every IPL alarm is a safety alarm. What it means is if you've identified a safety alarm that is SIL rated or is an IPL alarm, these are examples of the types of requirements that you might need to follow. And it also allows for the fact that the level of what you need to do may be different between these three levels of safety alarms. So no longer are we looking at safety alarms as just alarms that have a risk reduction of greater than 10, but we're opening up that definition to include IPL alarms and safeguards. And knowing that, or with that, we're trying to identify what the appropriate level of rigor would be for those types of safety alarms. Not to the same level as SIS alarms, but also more significant and rigorous than your general process alarms. Now, for any safety alarm, we need to make sure that the alarm system has gone through rationalization to make sure that the alarms are useful to the operator. We've eliminated alarms that uh, are not necessary. We've documented what the purpose of the alarm is, what the operator is supposed to do when the alarm occurs, what the cause, the likely causes are, the consequences, and that should be documented in a master alarm database. When it comes to how much time the operator has to respond, certainly 
the more time they have, the more likely that they will be able to respond effectively up to a limit, up to a certain point. So, but one example as a figure of merit for safety alarms is to, to make sure that the alarm, that the operator has about 20 minutes or so to respond might be a good starting point. Of course, that would be changed depending upon your plant and whether the operator, um, how, how easily it is for the operator to get to the final element to make the changes needed, whether they need to call a field operator Etc. So that would all go into um, coming up with a different minimum required time to have for the operator to respond to the alarm. Now, one of the things that really none of these other documents have explicitly talked about or hammered home sufficiently is the need to measure and review alarm system performance. As part of using safety alarms, one can say that an individual safety alarm, the effectiveness of it is influenced by the way the overall alarm system performs. So if you've got overloads for the operator, way too many alarms, if you have alarm floods and you have nuisance alarms, the presence of those factors will impact the likelihood that the operator would respond correctly to the safety alarm. So to be able to count on a safety alarm working, whether it's a sill rated alarm or just a safeguard, we do need to be reviewing the alarm system performance and ensuring that it meets the targets that are documented in your alarm philosophy or the alarm management standards. Some of, some of the key KPIs are shown here. So we need to make sure the overall alarm system performance is acceptable. We also need to review the performance of the individual alarms that we've designated as safety alarms. So information like how often the alarms are occurring, how much time they spend in alarm, whether they are nuisance alarms or not, that information is important as well so that you can make the changes necessary to uh, ensure that the safety alarm is going to work when it's needed. So we need to look at both the overall system performance and the performance of the individual safety alarms. There are DCSs now that allow you to create performance reports based on alarm class, so safety alarm or LOPA alarms as a class to get KPIs and measurements based on that. One of the things that we could use that for, for a safety alarm that's an IPL alarm, we could use that information to compare to our initiating frequency. So if we've got an IPL alarm that's occurring once a month, that's probably much higher than what our initiating event frequency is and might take us out of demand mode into continuous mode. So that's useful information to look at. If the alarm is a stale alarm, the time that the alarm is active and stale is time that it's not available. It's almost like it's bypassed it or disabled. It's not available in case another initiating event occurs. So it's not available to, to, do the, to provide the risk reduction. And if the alarm is shelved or out of service, so it's suppressed or disabled, again, that's time that the alarm is not available to provide the risk reduction. And if it is a nuisance alarm, then it is very likely that that operator may at some point ignore that alarm, which of course is going to compromise the, the performance of the alarm and the reliability. So if it is a nuisance alarm, for sure that needs to be fixed and assessed. And one could also think that if it is a nuisance alarm or if your alarm system performance is not acceptable, that you should not be counting on the safety alarm as part of your risk reduction methodology. You can also hopefully see that it's a good source of leading and lagging indicators. In this case, leading indicators because it's one of the early um, protection layers a leading indicator to demands on your SIS and your higher protection layers.
So that's kind of a summary of, of a pragmatic approach taking into account the existing standards and where the new um, ISA 849103 is going. As I mentioned, that's a document that's being created by a joint working group, bringing together both the alarm management and the functional safety committees from ISA. Additionally, the OG47 document that I mentioned from the HSC is being updated. That will, um, we're, is supposed to potentially will include now alarms that have risk reductions of 10 or less. So again, it opens up the definition of what is a safety alarm. It'll bring in terminology and concepts from IEC 62682, so the alarm management standard, including leveraging the highly managed alarm class and its requirements. So the discussion that we talked about earlier could be very relevant um, in that document. The Namora group in Germany is also working on a new guideline for protection layers that are implemented in the basic process control system. So again, something that can't have a risk reduction of greater than 10, but would be 10 or less. And then the ISA 84 um, TR04 is working on updating their guidelines, and that does include um, information about safety alarms. So the, the expectations on, on what to do with safety alarms and the requirements, I would say, are very much evolving. Some of the information comes from as far back as 1999. There's been a lot of work done in the functional safety world and the alarm management world that needs to be um, coalesced and brought together in, in a consistent manner. And um, that's hopefully what these documents are going to do. So in summary, Safety alarms are certainly an effective or can be an effective barrier to prevent the escalation of hazards to safety incidents. It's up to the end user or, or what I think is a good guidance to take away is that it will be, the onus will be on the end user to determine what is a safety alarm following the methodology of classification. Once you've determined whether it's a safety alarm or not, there are, as, as we've seen, um, several different guidelines and standards out there that, that provide recommendations for how to treat and manage the safety alarms. Um, each one seems to have a, a different type of information in it. And would also say that there are some prerequisites when it comes to using safety alarms. Uh, from an alarm management point of view, we want to make sure that you have a fully functioning alarm system, which includes having an alarm philosophy, having conducted alarm rationalization, documented the results, and then made that available as alarm response procedures. You must be measuring and improving your alarm system performance, so eliminating nuisance alarms and alarm floods. We want to make sure that we have competent and trained operators and some level of mechanical integrity program that includes testing and maintenance to make sure that those alarms will enunciate when they're supposed to. So look for additional guidance coming from um, the ISA committee or some of those other documents that I um, mentioned earlier. Now, this was meant to be a overview to whet your appetite about safety alarms and to show you some of the information that exists there. There was no way to uh, include everything in there because there's really enough to create a whole entire class on safety alarms. And that's what we are in the process of doing with the increased importance being paid to safety alarms, we are in the process of, a de of developing a class on safety alarms that will focus on how to handle them. So if you're interested in that, please uh, shoot us an email to let us know. And when that course is available, we'll certainly let you know. So at this point, I know we're basically out of time. So um, we don't have time to answer questions. I'll look to see whether there are any questions. Uh, looks like there's some. Um, 
but what I would say is we'll answer them offline and uh, distribute the answers to everyone. So then at this point, I'm going to say thank you for attending. Thank you for your interest. And we hope to see you soon again at a future Exeter webinar. Thank you and have a good day.